So we're about to do an extremely in-depth deep dive into projectile motion. There's a couple things that I'm going to suggest. First off, if you haven't watched two of my videos, uh, two specific ones, I suggest you do that. First, you need to watch how to solve kinematic equations. This one uh, goes through how to use just different kinematic equations to solve different physics problems. And then here, how to solve free fall problems. This is gonna be an important video to show you how to use kinematic equations and some basic understanding of gravity uh, so that we can use all that information to get into projectile motion. Full disclosure, this is gonna be a really long video. So if you need to take a break, feel free to do so. Skip around. I'm gonna put a menu up right now showing the different time stamp stamps and what we're going to be going over in each one of those situations so if you want to skip ahead you can if you need to watch the whole video you can if you watch this whole video i promise you you're going to know a whole lot about projectile motion you're going to probably be an expert by the time this video is over so if you're willing to grind it out feel free to grind it out if you just kind of want to skip around uh, look at different problems get a brief overview that's fine too. So, with that said, let's get started talking about projectile motion. First thing we're going to talk about when we are going over projectile motion are the equations that you will need to use. Now, this, the equations on the left over here, these are your typical kinematic equations. Uh, your velocity, VF, VI. Remember, VF is final velocity, VI is initial. And there's also this little zero knot. That means the same as VI. So you might see me uh, mix and match VI, V naught. They mean the same thing. But if you look over here, each one of these kinematic equations has a corresponding projectile motion equation. So here you got your V d over t and what I have is vx equals dx over t. Now you notice the x on these is not over here because over here we are going to start using x and y components. You notice here we got little y's uh, in different spots. So x means we're talking about things moving in the x direction which is horizontally and the y's mean we're talking about things moving in the y direction which is vertically. So you notice that our kinematic equations, uh, the first one is uh, in the x direction, and then this one, the vf equals vi plus at, we got vfy, that means this equation works in the y direction, viy plus gt. Instead of a, we have a g, that's because we're using acceleration due to gravity. Remember, g is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So anytime we're using projectile motion, gravity is going to be a... Uh, major player so keep that in mind and uh, all the equations are really the same uh, you notice here instead of using the letter D for distance which you can also use Delta X um, we use the letter Y so that's a that's a good thing to keep in mind right there Y and then uh, VF squared V naught squared VF Y squared V I Y squared uh, 2 G Y 2 A D so you notice the A is now gravity and the distance is a uh, y for the y direction. So we're going to be using these and uh, at one point we're probably going to add another equation to this. So you're going to need an equation sheet. If you don't have one of these sitting around, pause this video, copy these equations uh, down and you are going to be using them. You need them as reference. Don't try to do this all with memorization. I don't do that at all. I'm always referencing these equations and I've been doing this for years. So go ahead, write these down if you don't or if you have some equation that or equation sheet that you use in your class, try to use that one, and we'll go through these problems. So I want to keep this paper handy, and uh, we're going to go over some concepts first. So a couple things we need to go over. First thing we need to talk about is horizontal and vertical directions and some of the physical properties that happen when we're talking about the horizontal direction. We're talking about the vertical direction. Remember, horizontal is your x direction. So the first thing, there's only one thing you need to remember about the horizontal direction. And this is, when we're talking about this, we're talking about things flying through the air, basically. So if you go back to our, uh, our main thing here, we're talking about uh, stuff falling off cliffs or things launched through the air. When we're talking about these things, we're noticing 
that the objects are moving in the x direction, which is left and right, and the y direction up and down. They're moving in both those directions at the same time. So you got to think of these objects moving in those two directions. And as you notice here, the object falling off the cliff is moving horizontally, but it's moving vertically at the same time. So when we're solving these problems, you got to separate the horizontal and vertical components out, and we'll get more into that as we go. It's going to make a lot of sense. So when you're talking about objects uh, flying through the air, if you're thinking of just the horizontal direction, the velocity in the x direction is constant. So it's not going to speed up, and it's not going to slow down horizontally. But when we're talking about things vertically, it does have an acceleration, so it's not going to stay at a constant velocity vertically. It's going to be speeding up or slowing down vertically. And the acceleration rate will be the acceleration due to gravity. And on Earth, we know that is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Different planets, that's different. We'll get into that in a minute. So with that said, if it's accelerating, that means the velocity has to be changing in the y direction or the vertical direction. So the velocity is always changing the whole time. And another concept that we need to keep in mind is that the vy, the vertical velocity, is going to be zero meters per second when it's at the highest point. So if we go back to this picture right here, if something is moving through the air, at the highest point, the vertical velocity, how fast it's moving up and down, is going to be zero meters per second. Also right here with something falling off a cliff, at the highest point, the vertical velocity is zero, and then it starts to accelerate downwards from there. All right. And the last thing we need to go over on this, uh, t, which is time. The time is going to be the same for the x and y direction. So time is one of those things that's going to link your horizontal components and your vertical components. So whenever we're solving some of these problems, we're going to be given information in the x direction. We're going to be given some information in the y direction. And you can't mix and match those two things. If you're given a velocity in the x direction, you can't plug that into an equation that deals with the y direction. You, you can't switch these things back and forth. If you're dealing with something horizontally, you can't use acceleration due to gravity because acceleration due to gravity only affects the y direction. It does not affect the x direction. So when, when you're organizing all the information that's going to be in these problems, you need to make sure to separate your horizontal information and your vertical information. And typically, the way you can do that is with little x to say, hey, this is the x direction, and a little y to say, hey, this is the y direction. But time is the one thing that fits in both of these. That's why I kind of threw it in the middle here. So time, however long it takes for something to fall down, is also how long it's going to be moving horizontally. So let's look at this, going off that time talk that we just went on. So here, uh, if you run off a cliff or step off a cliff, you'll hit the water in the same amount of time. So here uh, we got a guy, he decides to just step off the cliff, fall straight down into the water, and also he tries to run off the cliff, and he follows this uh, sort of parabolic path here, and he's a projectile at that point, and he is falling at a rate of 9.8 meters per second vertically, so gravity's pulling him down here, but also gravity's pulling him down here. So in both of these situations, he's going to take the same amount of time to hit the ground. It doesn't matter if he just steps off or if he jumps off. A lot of people seem to think that this is going to take longer. Now he does travel a larger distance, that's true, but the time it takes for them to go and hit the water is going to be the same. This goes back to our fact that we said right here. Time is the same for the x and y direction. However long you're traveling horizontally is going to be the same as however long you're traveling vertically. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's a very important concept that a lot of people seem to uh, lose track of whenever they're solving these types of problems. So this is a very important note to take. Now let's analyze uh, an object that's falling off a cliff. This would be called a horizontal projectile. So here we just got a ball that rolls off a cliff. So whenever it's still up here on top of the cliff, you notice it has only a vx, which is a horizontal velocity, a velocity in the x direction. But as it falls, 
you notice that there is a VY that is showing up. And you notice those arrows are getting longer and longer. This VY, this vertical velocity, is getting faster and faster because it's accelerating vertically due to gravity. But you notice also the VX stays the same distance. That means it is traveling at the same speed horizontally the whole time, but it's accelerating vertically. So you got to think of these as two different components. So you got your X component and your Y component, and I'm going to be using X and Y components a lot through this video. So keep that in mind. So just as a quick reminder, the velocity in the X direction stays constant. The velocity in the Y direction is constantly changing and it's changing because of acceleration due to gravity. Remember, this is a horizontal projectile. We call it a horizontal projectile because it was moving horizontally and then it became a projectile. Go figure. Here's another situation that shows up a lot in physics classes and questions. And uh, it's a really good question. And it really uh, shows that you understand projectile motion. So here's a plane and it's going to drop a package and that package is gonna fall. You notice that the VX, the horizontal velocity stays the same, but the VY is constantly changing. So the VY is accelerating, the VX is not accelerating. Now, whatever speed or velocity this plane was traveling at when it dropped a package, that's going to be the horizontal velocity the whole time. So if we're assuming this plane was going 100 meters per second horizontally, that means the package is also going to be moving 100 meters per second horizontally as well. Now, with that said, if the plane drops the package, and keep in mind, we ignore air resistance. Pretend that air is not slowing anything down because air resistance makes everything really complicated. But if the plane is going 100 meters per second horizontally, that means the entire time this package is falling, it's going to be moving 100 meters per second horizontally as well because they were originally tra traveling together and then the package fell off. So they would both be traveling 100 meters per second horizontally, which means the entire time the plane is flying, the plane will stay directly above the package. So as the package is falling, the plane is going to stay right above it the whole time. Okay, so with all that conceptual information put into your brain, let's put some of it into practice and try to solve a few problems. So the first one's gonna be pretty simple. A ball rolls off a cliff at five meters per second. It takes seven seconds to hit the ground. Solve for the following variables. So we wanna solve for y, vfy, and dx. So y would be the height of the cliff VFY is the final velocity in the Y direction. So how fast is it moving vertically once it hits the ground? And uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. And then we have DX, which is how far it moves horizontally, or how far away from the cliff is it gonna land? And keep in mind for this, we're probably gonna need to have our equation sheet handy. All right, so first thing that I always say to do when you're solving any of these problems is to write out everything that you know. The things that we know is Vx, which is five meters per second. We also know the time it takes is seven seconds. There's another thing that we know, but it's not written in this equation, and that's our acceleration due to gravity, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So we got, uh, we got three variables that we know. We're gonna to try to solve for these three. I am going to look at my equation sheet here, and I'm gonna think, okay, well, I know Vx and I know time. Well, this equation right here, Vx equals dx over t, that has two of the three variables that I need, and I can solve for dx really quickly. So let's just go ahead and do that one real quick and easy dx equals dx over t. Plug our numbers in. 5 equals dx over t. Oh, wait, whoops. Let's go ahead and make that 7 because that's what we're doing. Uh, then we're going to multiply 5 
times 7 equals dx. So dx equals 35 meters. Hey, cool. Really simple and easy, right? Let's go ahead and put that over here, 35 meters. So that was the easiest one to solve for. Let's go and try to solve for another one of these. Let's see here. Let's look at our equation sheet. All right, so we know that time is going to be helpful in the y direction. We also know gravity is going to be helpful in the y direction. But this vx is not helpful in the y direction. Remember, you can't mix x and y components. And the rest of our answers need the y component. So this piece of information, useless from now on. So we need to find y and vfy. Um, it doesn't matter which one we choose. There is one more piece of information that I need to remind you of. The velocity at the highest point is going to be zero in the y direction. So what that means is that right here, right as the ball rolls off the cliff, the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. So whenever we are looking at these two equations right here, or actually even this one, whichever one we end up using, this viy is going to end up being zero. So let's look at uh, VFY, this VFY equals VIY plus GT. Uh, this equation would be good to solve for VFY. So let's go ahead and do that. Remember, always write out your equation first. And then we're going to plug our numbers in. So we don't know VFY, that's what we're solving for, so we're going to leave that as so. VIY, remember that's 0 meters per second, plus G, which is negative 9.8. And then our time is going to be 7 seconds, because time is the one thing that works in the X and Y direction. So let's see here, we got basically 9.8 negative times 7. It's going to be negative 68.6. So your final velocity in the y direction is negative 68.6 meters per second. And that is perfectly fine that it's a negative number because it is moving in the negative direction. And then the final thing that we need to solve for is y and that can be solved using this equation right here, y equals viy plus one-half gt squared. I'm going to run out of room. All right, so then we go plug our numbers in. And then after we plug our numbers in, we'll calculate what our answer is. So 0 0.5 times 9.8 negative times 7 squared. So y is equal to negative 240.1 meters. And it's negative because it fell downwards 240.1 meters. If you wanted to report that as positive 240.1, that's fine. Uh, you, if you say that this is 0 and this, is, this would be 240, but if you said this was 0, then this would be negative 240. It all just kind of depends on where you made your 0 be. So that's perfectly fine. And that's a... Uh, very basic, simple, how to solve a horizontal projectile motion problem. Remember, write down everything you know, try to find something that's easy to solve for, and then just kind of go from there. We could have solved for any of these first. All right, so the next problem we're going to talk about is an airplane flying horizontally at 200 meters per second needs to drop a package on a target. How far behind the target should the plane be when it releases the package if it is flying 500 meters in the air? So this goes back to this situation right here. So if the plane is flying horizontally up here, uh, it can't drop the package directly over the target because if, if the target is right here 
and it drops the package right here, it's not going to fall straight down. It's going to follow this, this path right here, and it's going to miss its target. So the plane has to drop the package before the target, and we're going to calculate how far behind the target the plane needs to be when it drops the package for it to hit the target at the correct time. So first off, we need to figure out everything that we know. So we got our VX horizontally flying at 200 meters per second. Uh, we also know that it's Y distance. This is how high the plane is flying. That is 500 meters. What we're trying to solve for is x, the horizontal distance. We don't know that. So basically what we're solving for is how far the package is going to travel horizontally before it hits the ground. So what you might say is, well, that's super easy. There's already an equation here, vx equals dx over t, okay? vx equals dx over t, and we're just going to solve for dx, right? Well, it would be that simple if we knew the time. We don't know the time, so we can't just simply use this. But this 500 meters in the air, that's actually useful information because we can use this 500 meters and possibly solve for the time in one of these other equations and then use that time and put it back into this equation up here and then solve. So it's kind of like a two-step process to this problem. So let's look at these equations. Um, we know y, we know the height, we know the initial velocity in the y direction, we know that's zero at this point, we know acceleration due to gravity, and we can try to solve for time using this right here. And during this, we're actually going to develop a new equation that's going to be extremely useful to you, and I promise you that you will be happy that I showed you this. So we're going to use the equation y equals viy plus one-half gt squared. Now, remember, if something is being dropped, the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. Zero plus anything, well, that just kind of goes away, so it's not super helpful for us. If the object did have an initial velocity, like you threw it down instead of dropping it, then there would be a viy. But in this situation, it's just being dropped, so your VIY is zero. So that gives us an equation of y equals one-half gt squared, because zero plus anything just gets rid of it. So what are we solving for here? Remember, we're trying to find the time in this equation so we could just plug our numbers in and get dx. But, like I told you, we're going to develop a new equation here that's going to be super useful. So if we're solving for time, then let's go ahead and rearrange this to solve for time. So 1 half it turns into 2y equals gt squared. And then divide by g, so you got 2y over g equals t squared. And then get rid of that square by doing a square root. So t is equal to the square root of 2y over g. So let's go ahead and put that formula onto our equation sheet here. That's going to be useful because we're not, I don't want us to have to constantly redo this whole algorithm here to get a new equation. So anytime that you're going to solve for time and you have a good amount of information in the y direction, you can just use this formula. So for the time that it's going to take for this object to fall, it's going to be the square root of 2, and our y is 500, so 2 times 500, divided by g, which is negative 9.8. And we're going to run into a little bit of a problem here. So let's just go ahead and plug this number, these numbers into our calculator and then see what happens. One thing that I notice a lot of people do with this, and I want to go ahead and just, like I said, this video is going to be in-depth, so 
I want to bring up a problem that a lot of people do. And I kind of did it a little bit here. When you draw this square root sign in this situation, it looks like I'm just square rooting the top line of this fraction. You can't do that. You have to square root everything under here. So I'm going to kind of modify my square root to be everything. Which means you probably want to put everything in here first in the calculator and then square root your answer. Let me show you what I mean. So 2 times 500, 2 times 500 equals 1,000 divided by 9.8 negative. You get negative 102 and then you would square root that. Okay, so this is where a problem will come up. You can't square root a negative. If I try to square root this, I'm just going to get an error message. So there's two ways you could think about it. You could think, okay, well, this is actually going to fall 500 feet, so that could be a negative 500. Or you could just say, look, I know that this is supposed to be a positive number. I get it. Um, and just turn that negative into a positive. So let's do this again. 2 times 500 negative equals negative 1,000 divided by 9.8 negative, and boom, now we have it as a positive number. Square root that, you get 10.1. So our time, put a little extra line over here, time is going to equal 10.1 seconds. And now we have enough information to where we can plug it into our original equation that we wanted to use in the first place. So Vx is 200, dx we don't know, and then the time is 10.1. Do a little algebra, dx equals 200 times 10.1. I still have that in my calculator, I'll just leave it there. dx equals 2020.3 meters. And that's a beautiful answer right there. So keep in mind, what was happening here? Well, the plane was flying, and it was flying 200 meters per second, and it was 500 meters in the air. How far before the target did it need to be when it released the package? Well, if it releases the package 2,020.3 meters before the target, then the package will fall and land directly on the target. All right, so here we go, a little more advanced problem for horizontal projectiles. So we got an astronaut on planet Cobol, throws a rock horizontally with a speed of 5.25 meters per second. The rock falls a vertical distance of 2.23 meters and lands a distance of 9.5 meters away from the astronaut. What is the acceleration due to gravity on Cobol? And I went ahead and drew a little diagram here uh, showing what happens. So the astronaut throws it, it has a 5.25 meter per second horizontal velocity. It falls downwards 2.23 meters and it falls horizontally 9.5 meters. And we're trying to figure out the acceleration due to gravity on this planet COBOL that this astronaut is uh, visiting. So I don't have enough space here to solve this problem. So instead I'm gonna use this little piece of paper I'm going to start writing out everything that I know. So I first know the horizontal speed or the horizontal velocity. 5.25 meters per second. I next know the vertical distance, 2.23 meters. And then lastly, I know the horizontal distance, which is x of 9.5 meters and I'm looking for acceleration due to gravity on this new planet COBOL. Another thing that we uh, need to remember and it's not directly given to us but we know it and since, since it's a horizontal projectile the initial velocity in the y direction is 0 meters per second so let's go to our equation sheet, try to figure out which equation we can use with this information. So we got Vx, 
uh, and we're looking for g. So whatever we're going to try to solve for needs to have g in it. So these three equations down here have g. This top one does not. So that's not really useful to us at the moment, I'll say. And also our new equation has g in it. Okay. So let's see uh, if we have all the other variables here. We don't have time. We don't know the time yet. So anything with time is out. So that leaves us with this equation, right? Well, there's one problem with this one. We don't have VFY. That's nowhere in here. We don't know the final velocity in the Y direction. We don't know how fast it's going vertically when it hits the ground. So first off, none of these equations work. So maybe, so that means that this is going to be a two-step problem. One thing that, uh, one little tip that will be very helpful is if you can solve for time, usually that gives you a lot more pieces of information. We can't directly use this one down here because g is something that we don't know. But we can use this one up here. We know vx and we know distance in the x direction, so we can solve for time. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's get time on our list of things we know, and then we'll go from there. So we have vx equals dx over t. 5.25 equals 9.5 divided by t. So t is equal to 5.25 times 9.5, forgive my handwriting, 5.25 times 9.5, whoops, made a mistake, bad algebra, so when we rearrange this it's going to be t equals 9.5 divided by 5.25, so we got 9.5 divided by 5.25. So the time that the object is in the air, 1.8, say 1.81 seconds. Okay, so now we have time, and that's helpful. Let's go back to our equation sheet now that we have time. Remember, we're looking for acceleration due to gravity. So we can use one of these two, this equation down here, it doesn't have time, so that's not really helpful to us. We're going to use one of these two, but once again, we don't know the final velocity in the y direction, so this, this equation right here is out. That leaves us with this one right here. y equals viy plus one-half gt squared. Now I will go to our original sheet. y equals, write out your equation plug in your numbers. So the y is 2.23, vi y is 0, plus 1 half g is what we are solving for, and then time 1.81 squared. Let's plug some of this into the calculator. 1.81 squared times 0.5, so we got 2.23 equals, that goes away, 1.63805g, divide both sides by 1.63805, so g is equal to 2.23 divided by 1.63805, man I can't do that in my head, 2.23 divided by 1.63805, that equals acceleration due to gravity of 1.36 meters per second squared. So on this planet, things fall a lot slower. So that's a little bit more of an advanced horizontal projectile problem. Let's go and talk about some other types of projectiles, more specifically projectiles that are launched at an angle. Now before you start going cross-side, just kind of ignore the top part of this paper for now. Let's just focus on this down here, this projectile that is moving at an angle. You notice at the start over here, let's zoom in a little bit. 
you notice at the start over here, this orange line is the launch angle or the angle that the object is actually released at. So it goes up at an angle, uh, upwards and to the right. And one thing that we need to be familiar with is that we need to break this up into its two components, its velocity in the x direction and its velocity in the y direction. So this velocity right here is its actual velocity, but remember, we need to think of this moving in the x direction and the y direction for us to be able to do our calculations and kind of make more sense of it. So as the object is flying through the air, let's look at the horizontal velocity first, this vx. Let's just focus on that throughout its path. You notice that the vx stays the same the whole time. It never speeds up, it never slows down. In the x direction, it stays constant. So however fast it was moving horizontally here, it's still moving horizontally that fast all the way over here. Then let's look at the y direction. Since this is being launched upwards, it's flying upwards and then falling down. So it starts off with a very large velocity in the y direction. And then that velocity in the y direction gets smaller and smaller. You notice these upward arrows are getting smaller. And then whenever it hits its highest point, there is no more vertical velocity. It's not moving vertically at this particular point. It goes back to our note that the velocity at the highest point in the vertical direction is zero. So Vy at this point is going to be zero. And then after that, you notice the velocity is now pointing downwards. So the velocity going downwards starts getting larger and larger because it's accelerating downwards. And also, the whole time that the object is going through the air, its acceleration is always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It never changes its acceleration. Here the acceleration is the exact same as it is here, as it is here. So the whole time it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared downwards, but the velocity is getting smaller to the point of zero and then it increases downwards. And that's just uh, what you would expect with gravity pulling things down. It's going to slow it down, bring it to a stop, and then start pulling it downward, and it's going to start moving downwards. So with that said, let's, let's remove the top part here, and let's look at some of these uh, equations at the top. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is this one over here. Remember I said we need to break up the uh, velocity into its x and y components. And one way that we can do that is using a formula very similar to Pythagorean theorem. So instead of a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we can say vx squared plus vy squared equals v squared. So this v is the actual velocity, vx is how fast it's moving horizontally, vy is vertically. And so you can use this to find the uh, actual velocity of the object. So this is one of our strategies that we're going to use when we break up the velocity vector into its x and y components. The other thing that we're going to need to remember is our SOHCAHTOA rules. So remember, uh, sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine theta is adjacent to hypotenuse. Tan theta, opposite over adjacent. So you're going to need to be familiar with this. And uh, I'm going to show you how all this kind of is going to work together to solve for angled projectiles. The next thing we need to talk about, uh, just kind of get a little bit of information in your head, is launch angles. So this kind of gives you a bit of a conceptual understanding to know what, uh, what to expect. So the first thing we need to talk about is when something is launched at a 45 degree angle, this is going to provide the greatest range of the projectile. So if anything is launched 45 degrees, it's going to give it its longest distance horizontally. And that's because the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction are going to be equal at that point. Next thing we need to know, a uh, 90 degree launch angle, which is basically straight up, that provides the greatest height of the projectile. So it's going to give it a lot of height. Uh, there's going to be no horizontal velocity with a 90 degree projectile and all of the velocity is going to be in the y direction. So in this particular situation, Vy would equal V. 
but this is going to give you no range. There's going to be no uh, horizontal distance gained here. It just goes straight up and comes straight back down. And the last thing you need to know about launch angles is complementary angles. So what that means is uh, different angles can produce the same range of a projectile. And complementary angles always add up to 90 degrees. So if something is launched at 30 degrees, it may not go very high, but it'll land this far away. And if something is launched at 60 degrees, it'll go higher, but it'll land at the exact same spot. So 30 degree launch angle and 60 degree launch angle, those are considered complementary angles right here because they're going to have the same range. They're gonna go the same X distance. And you notice they both add up to 90 degrees. Same thing with a 10 degree launch angle and an 80 degree launch angle. The 10 degree is not gonna go very high. The 80 degree will go very high, but they're both gonna end up landing at the exact same spot. Once again, with a 20 degree and a 70 degree launch angle, just another example. 20 degree may not go very high, but it's gonna land right here. 70 degree angle will go much higher but it's gonna land at the exact same spot that a 20 degree launch angle would. So we call those complementary angles. So starting off here, we got a projectile being launched and we're given the velocity as 20 meters per second. So that's this velocity right here. And we're also given the angle of uh, 25 degrees. So the angle that it's launched in respect to the horizontal is going to be 25 degrees and we need to figure out the total time that the object's going to be in the air, the velocity in the x direction, initial velocity in the y direction, and the total distance that the object's going to travel. So the first thing that I want to do is I probably want to solve for the vx and the vyi. Those are probably going to be the best things to solve for and we're going to solve them using our sine, cosine, and tangents. And with that said, we're going to add a few equations to our toolbox here, and these are gonna be super useful. So let's go, uh, let's just do a little math lesson before we jump into that problem. So if you have a velocity of an object being launched like so, we need to break it up into its x component and its y component. So when it's initially launched, it's launched this way, but we can think of it in its x and y directions. So if you remember your SOHCAHTOA, sine is the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So you remember sine theta is going to be equal to opposite. So if this is our angle right here, the opposite is Vy. So that's Vy over V. And cosine is going to be equal to adjacent, which is Vx over hypotenuse, which is V. Now these two are going to be extremely useful for the rest of, for the remainder of this because if we want to solve for Vy, well it's going to be V sine theta is equal to Vy. If we want to solve for Vx, that's going to be V cosine theta is equal to Vx. Keeping these two things in mind is going to be super helpful. So let's go ahead and add that to our equation sheet. So we're going to be using that a whole lot here. And we might want to go ahead and put our uh, version of Pythagorean theorem on our equation sheet as well. So we're just kind of adding equations to our equation sheet. Now let's get back to that problem we were talking about a minute ago. So let's first solve for Vx. So looking at our equation sheet here, Vx is equal to V cosine theta.
And then we can just kind of plug some numbers in V and theta. So Vx is equal to 20 cosine 25. Let's plug this into our calculator. 25 cosine times 20, 18.126. So our Vx is equal to 18.126 meters per second. Don't forget your units. So Vx is equal to 18.126. Let's go ahead and do Vy also. So Vy, remember from our equation sheet, Vy is V sine theta. Sine theta. And then we're going to plug our numbers in. So Vy is equal to... 20 sine 25, so let's do that over here. 25 sine times 20, 8.452. Vy is equal to 8.452 meters per second. Now remember, that's just the velocity, the initial velocity in the y direction. That's how fast it was initially going in the y direction. Remember, it's going to slow down, come to zero, and then start accelerating downwards. So that vy is constantly changing. So it's important to denote with a little i or a little o that it's the initial velocity in the y direction. So we got two things solved for here. Um, the next thing we want to solve for is the total time that the object is going to be in the air. This brings up a little bit of a caveat that we need to uh, take into account. And that is, in this particular situation, these equations are only useful for half the time that the object is in the air. And there's a reason behind that. And we're going to talk about a special case from, from that later on in the very advanced problems. But what's happening here is we know the velocity in the y direction here and we know it's changing in the y direction as it goes there's only one other spot that we are for sure that we know the velocity in the y direction and that's right here the velocity in the y direction here is zero meters per second so we need to say that this is our initial velocity and we can say that this is our final velocity but the problem with the time total is we're looking for the total time in the air. Well, what's happening here is however long it takes for it to go up, it's going to take the same amount of time for it to come down. So if we figure out the time to here, we just multiply it by 2, and we get the time for here. So And then we get the total time that the object's in the air. If we're going to say that this is our initial, and we say that this is our final, and we're looking for time, well, which equation would we end up using? Well, we know the final velocity in the y direction, initial velocity in the y direction. We know that the acceleration due to gravity is negative uh, 9.8, and we're going to solve for time. So, hey, we can use this equation right here. You might say, well, why aren't we using this one? Well, because we don't know how high it goes, so that's not really useful to us. But this one has all the information that we need. All right, so there's our equation, Vfy equals Viy plus Gt. Our final velocity, we'll say this is our final velocity of zero. Our initial velocity in the y direction, 8.542 plus g, negative 9.8, and then time, what we're solving for. So let's just kind of go ahead and do some algebra, subtract the 8.542 over here equals negative 9.8 times t. Divide both sides by negative 9.8. Cancels out. Here we go. 8.542 negative divided by 9.8 negative. So the time to get from here to here is 0.87. We'll just say 0.872. And remember, that's only half the time 
we are looking for the total time. So if we just multiply that by two, so we'll say t total is equal to 1.74 seconds. Awesome. The last thing we need to figure out is the distance total. In this situation, we're talking about the distance in the x direction. So how far does it move horizontally? That's pretty simple. We got our vx equals dx over t equation. We know the vx right here, 18.126. We know the time, we just solve for it, that's how long it's in the air, and we'll just plug those in, solve for distance in the x direction. So we got 18.126 equals dx over 1.74. So that ends up being dx is 18.126 times 1.74 basically 31.5 meters. Now, uh, one thing I wanna bring up, if you're getting slightly different numbers than what I am, that's probably fine if it's just a small rounding error that's going on. Uh, no harm, no foul there. If you got like 31.2 or 31.3 here, and I got 31.5, we're doing it the same. We're probably just rounding our numbers differently, so don't stress too much about that. All right, so let's look at this next problem. A golf ball is struck with a driver on level ground. It lands 275 meters away, 9.78 seconds later. What is the direction and magnitude of the initial velocity? So we're given some piece of information. It goes 275 meters. It's a pretty good drive and it is in the air for 9.78 seconds. And we're looking for the initial velocity. So how fast was it uh, actually leaving the T at? Um, and what angle, that's when it, when it asks what's the direction, it's trying to figure out what angle it was hit at. So I might need a different piece of paper to solve for this one. And forgive this parabola, it's not a perfect one, but you get the idea of what's going on here. So let's kind of zoom in on this V right here. So there's the velocity vector. That's the direction it was hit at. And we need to break this up into its X components and its Y components. That's always very helpful. So here's VX. Here is your VY. So if we're able to find Vx and we're able to find Vy, then it will be reasonable to calculate for V. And there's a few things that were given to us in the problem here. Uh, it lands 275 meters away, so that's our dx. And also, it is in the air for 9.78 seconds, so that's your total time in the air, or your hang time, if you will, 9.78 seconds. We want to find V, and we want to find the direction, also known as the angle that it was hit at. So now we've got all of our information up here. We don't really need this anymore. So you might want to say, well, I guess we're going to need to use our trig functions here, right? Well, each one of our trig functions has V in it, Vx, Vy, or some, something of those sorts. We don't know Vx, we don't know Vy, and we don't know V. So we can't use any of our trig functions, which means we gotta go to our kinematic equations. And looking at this, we know dx, and we know the time that it's in the air. We can find Vx, can't we? Vx equals dx over t. Let's go for that. Let's start there. So we'll say Vx equals dx over t. So Vx is equal to our distance in the x direction, 275. Our time is 9.78. So Vx is equal to 275 divided by 9.78. 28.12 meters per second. So that's useful information for us. 
Now the next thing that would be useful for us is to find Vy. Now if we look at our equation sheet over here, there's a lot of equations with uh, Vy, I, Viy, initial velocity in the y direction, these two right here. Um, we know the final velocity if we're saying the highest point is the uh, final velocity. The only caveat we need to do if we're saying that the highest point is the final velocity is the time can't be the full hang time of 9.78. It would have to be half the time. Because remember, at the highest point, we'll say this is the highest point, the final velocity in the y direction would be zero meters per second, but that's not the full time, it's only half the time. So here the time is equal to one half of the total time. So let's write down this equation right here. Vfy equals Viy plus Gt. So remember we're saying that the highest point is going to be the final velocity. So we'll say that's zero. The initial velocity in the y direction, we don't know that, so we're going to leave that as Viy plus acceleration due to gravity, negative 9.8. And then time is going to be 9.78 divided by 2. That way we know it's half the time. So let's go ahead and solve for this. So 9.78 divided by 2. So it goes 4.89, multiply that by 9.8 negative. We got that, so we're going to say 0 equals Viy plus negative 47.922. And then when we rearrange that, we got Viy is equal to 47.922 meters per second. So that's some more useful information for us. So now we know the Vx, we also know the Vy. I think at this point, we can start using our trig formulas to solve for V, and we can also use it to solve for the angle. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and solve for V using this uh, version of Pythagorean theorem. So let's do that up here. Vx squared plus Vy squared equals V squared plug in our numbers, 28.12 squared plus 47.922 squared equals V squared. Let's start throwing these big numbers into our calculator. 28.12 squared plus 47.922 squared equals that, and then we know to get rid of the squared, we got a square root, so just take that number in your calculator, square root it, you get your V, which is 55.56 meters per second. So that is your V, 55.6 meters per second. I'm just gonna round it there. So there, you got your V, that's awesome. And at this point, we need to find the angle and the angle can be very simple. We can use either one of these equations and solve for the angle. Let's, uh, let's just use the cosine here. V cosine theta equals Vx. V cosine theta equals Vx. And so we're going to be solving for theta. Let's go ahead and rearrange this before we throw numbers in there and make it all complicated. So it's going to turn into cosine theta equals Vx over V. And then theta is going to be cosine inverse Vx over V. Now let's plug in our numbers. Theta equals cosine inverse Vx, which was 28.12. And then V, which we found out was here, was 55.56. And now let's plug this into our calculator. Let's do what's inside the parentheses first. 28.12 divided by 55.56 equals that. And then we need to do cosine, so it's second, cosine inverse. So the angle that it was hit at was 59.5 
9 degrees. So we got our V and we got our direction. So this is the velocity that it was hit at, and that's the direction it was hit at 59.59 degrees from the horizontal. Okay, so that was a little bit more of an advanced problem. Let's try one more. This is more like an AP level problem. So if you're in an AP class, uh, be prepared to see something like this where basically no information is given to you and you have to solve with a very specific answer. So here a projectile is launched with an initial speed of V. At its highest point its speed is V over 2. What is the launch angle? So you look at this and you're like, I didn't get a single number. All I, given, all I was given was V and V over 2 and it's asking me for an angle? Good grief. Yeah, exactly. And, and these are the kind of questions that you'll get on your AP test, AP exams, and or maybe even, even if you have a difficult just physics class in general, you might be given a question like this and you have to extrapolate a lot of information from it. So there's one key piece of information in this problem. It says at its highest point. So this is a projectile going through that parabola and we're talking about at the highest point. There's one thing we know at the highest point. We know that there is no vertical velocity at the highest point. All the velocity is horizontal at that point. So that means Vx is going to be equal to V over 2. Because at the highest point, that's all the velocity is horizontally. And it says at the highest point, its speed is V over 2. So we got Vx equals V over 2. And it's asking for the angle. Well, we're given Vx, and we have this letter V here, some arbitrary speed. We don't know what it is. But we have this equation right here, V cosine theta equals Vx. So let's just kind of start with that and roll from there, see what we can figure out. So V cosine theta equals Vx. And let's go ahead and rearrange this to have make it say theta equals whatever. So that turns into theta equals cosine inverse Vx over V. And this is a, a substitution method that you want to kind of get familiar with. So if we say Vx equals V over 2, well that means if we have Vx here, we can substitute that to V over 2. So let's say theta equals cosine inverse V over 2 divided by V. And you can probably simplify this in your head. I'm just going to do it as side work over here to kind of show the process. So that's the same as V over 2 is equal to V over 1. So the way I think of it is I put this on the bottom, the top part of the fraction on the bottom, and then the bottom part of the fraction up here on the top. So that turns to V times 1 divided by V times 2. And then the V's cancel out. So this ends up being theta equals cosine inverse 1 half. And some of you might know this in your head as well, but theta is going to be equal to 0.5 cosine inverse, which is 60 degrees. So you can see even when you're given next to no information, you can still find some very specific numbers that can help you solve a problem. The next thing we're going to get into is uh, projectiles when they're launched at an angle and they are not on flat ground. So here's a situation where this object is launched at this angle and it doesn't just come back to where it started, it actually keeps falling. There's a few little caveats that might fall into these categories. These get a little bit more complicated, a little bit more advanced, a few more steps, a few more substitutions, a few more uh, tricky things that you need to do with the math. So let's get into that. So here we have a projectile is launched off a 20 meter tall building. Uh, using the information in the diagram, determine how far away from the building the projectile will land. So 
Here you got your V equals 12 meters per second. That's the velocity it's launched at. And it's launched at 55 degrees. And we're trying to figure out how far away from the building. So we're looking for the horizontal displacement or the DX, if you will. Um, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that we need to take into account in this problem. And I can go ahead and tell you right now I'm not going to have enough room to solve it on here. So I'm going to be doing my work on this paper and referencing back and forth. So let's go ahead and write down everything that we know. We know the V is equal to 12 meters per second. We know the angle is 55 degrees. We know the Y is 20 meters. We also know acceleration due to gravity negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for x. Okay. So that's everything that we know. We're looking for how far away it's going to be. Um, so once again, we could say, well, we got vx equals dx over t, and we could solve for dx. Two problems. We don't know vx, and we don't know t but we do have enough information to where we can solve for Vx, we can solve for T, and then finally solve for Dx. So a lot of steps that need to go into this process. Uh, first off, let's go ahead and just solve for Vx. This is something we can do pretty simply because looking at our, looking at our equation sheet, we got V cosine theta equals Vx. We know V, we know theta. Let's solve for Vx. So V cosine theta equals Vx. So we got 12 cosine 55 equals Vx. Plug this into our calculator. 55, let's get rid of that, cosine, times 12, 6.88. So Vx is equal to 6.88 meters per second. Useful information, I'll underline it. The next thing we need to figure out is time. Well, how much time is it going to spend in the air? Now, finding the time is actually going to be probably the hardest part of this whole problem. Um, but it's something that we need to do because we have to think of time in a couple different segments. There's going to be the time that it takes to reach its highest point, and then there's going to be the time it takes to get back to horizontal, and then it's going to keep falling from there. So probably what you want to do is figure out how long it's going to take to get to the highest point, and then figure out how long it's going to take to get to here, and then figure out how long it's going to take to get to here. So we're going to divide this up into three segments, and we're going to figure out how long it takes to get to each one of these. So it's going to be basically three different problems. So we'll call this, you know, section one, section two, and then section three, because we're just breaking it up into its three different spots. So let's say for section one, we know we got to find the initial velocity in the y direction as well. To be honest with you, a lot of the time you're going to need to find that, and it's not too hard to do. Remember, it's v sine theta equals vy, so that's 12 sine 55 equals vy, so 55 sine times 12, 9.83. Vy equals 9.83 meters per second. Useful information, I'll underline it. So let's think about section one here. So remember, this is the initial velocity in the y direction. So let's think about section one here. Uh, we know the initial velocity is gonna be 9.83. The velocity here is going to be zero. We'll call that final velocity. Vy here is equal to zero meters per second. 
And remember, we're doing all of this to solve for the time it takes for it to hit the ground. So, for section one, let's use uh, this equation right here. We got the final velocity, we'll say that's zero. The initial, we'll use this, 9.83, g gravity, t time. We're going to plug our numbers in, so uh, VFY is going to be 0, 9.83 plus negative 9.8T, so that's negative 9.83 equals negative 9.8T, this is basically 1, so T is equal to... 9.83 negative divided by 9.8 negative 1.003 we'll just say 1.00 and I'm going to hold on to all those numbers there 1.00 seconds and then section 2 well it's going to be the same amount of time to go the second half so for section 1 and section 2 uh, they're going to be the same And then we need to figure out section 3. So section 3 is this from the point that's level to the building down all the way to the street. So at this point right here, we actually have an initial velocity. Uh, the velocity going downwards here is going to be the same that the velocity was going upwards over here. It's just kind of flipped over and reversed. So However fast it was going up here is how fast it's going to be going down here. And that's actually good information to know. So we're going to say our, one of the things that we know over here is our VYI for section 3 is going to be negative 9.83 meters per second, negative because it's going down. One thing we don't know though is the final velocity. We don't know how fast it's going when it actually hits the street in the y direction. We could definitely solve for it, but we don't necessarily have to. So if you look over here, these two, this one has final velocity in the y direction, this one has the final velocity in the y direction, those aren't exactly useful to us, but this one probably will be. We know y, we know the height of the building, we know the initial velocity, we just said that is going to be negative 9.83, and then we also know g, and we're going to solve for the time. Remember, we're doing all of this just to solve for the time it takes to hit the ground. So, here's our equation. y equals viy plus 1 half gt squared. So we'll plug in our numbers. Remember, the y is 20 meters. Our initial velocity in the y direction negative 9.83 plus 1 half negative 9.8 t squared. So let's go ahead and uh, do some math here. So 20 equals negative 9.83 minus 4.9 t squared. Quick note that I want to make, because this is falling downwards 20 meters, we want to make this 20 meters negative. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. You would have ran into a little bit of a problem coming up here in a second. But uh, yeah, keep that in mind. So now we're going to add 9.83. So we got 20 negative plus 9.83. You get negative 10.17 equals negative 4.9 t squared divided by 4.9 negative so we got t squared equals 2.0755 and then you square root that so the time for section 3 1.44 one seconds. All right, so 
if you add up the three different times, so for time one plus time two plus time three, you will get your time total, the total time that the object is in the air. So that's going to be... Sorry about that. I went ahead and solved the problem without you. Forgive me. I know you missed the really exciting reveal, but we found out that the total time was 3.441 seconds. We plugged the time in up here with our VX, and we got the distance in the X direction as 23.67 meters. Once again, if you didn't get that exact number there, don't feel bad. Uh, there's a lot of rounding that goes on, but you should be somewhere close to this number. If you're not, you might have done something incorrectly, maybe didn't do a negative or uh, maybe missed a square, something like that somewhere along the way. Now let's move on to the very last problem that we're going to do, and this video will be over and you will be a projectile motion genius. So here's a question that I think is really good, and it also gives a uh, very nice, clean trick that you can do on some of these types of problems. So what's going on? A young girl swings on a rope above a local swimming hole. When she lets go of the rope, her initial velocity is 3 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. If she is in flight for 1.2 seconds, how high above the water was she when she let go of the rope? So here she is, she's swinging on the rope, three meters per second, goes at this angle, and then crashes into the water. And so you're probably looking at this and you're like, oh great, it's another one of those building problems with three different sections, divide it up, figure it all out. If you want to do it that way, that's totally fine, you can. But there's actually a simpler way to do it on this particular problem. So let's start off by just writing down everything that we know. So her velocity is 3 meters per second. The angle is 30 degrees. She's in the air for 1.2 seconds. And we are looking for y. We are looking for how high above the ground is she. Now there's one more piece of information that would be good to know, and that would be our vy, our initial velocity in the y direction, uh, would be nice to know. The reason why I'm not concerned with the vx is because this question isn't asking anything about the x direction, and we can't mix our x and y components up. So with all that said, vyi would be very uh, useful, viy, and we know that that is going to be equal to v sine theta. I could go and plug those numbers in and solve for it. I don't want to do that yet though. Let's go back to our equation sheet here, and we're trying to find y. We're trying to figure out how high off the ground she is. Well, here's an equation with y equals viy, and we just kind of figured out a little formula to solve for that, so we can use that if we need it, plus one-half g, we know acceleration due to gravity, uh, times squared, well, we got our time there. You might look at this equation right here and say, hey, we got it. And some of you might be like, but wait a minute, isn't that initial velocity changing with every section? Yes, it is. But there's one really neat trick about this that you need to remember, and it's that the whole time that she is flying through the air, gravity is acting on her the whole time. So her acceleration is the exact same the whole time she's in the air, which actually makes it to where if we know the initial velocity in the y direction upwards, this all is still going to work out because gravity is pulling down on her the whole time and we got this time over here, the full time that she's in the air. So this actually makes sense to use in this situation. We don't have to break it up into all these different sections. So let's go ahead and use this equation right here, and let's plug our numbers in. It's honestly that simple. We just plug all these in. So uh, we got, now we're gonna replace VIY with V sine theta, all right? So Y is going to be equal to V sine theta and V, is 3 sine theta, theta is 30, plus 1 half 
negative 9.8 and then time squared, 1.2 squared. So let's start plugging and chugging these numbers in. So 30 sine 0.5 times 3, 1.5 plus 1 half 9.8, 1.2 squared, 0.5 times 9.8 negative times 1.2 squared equals negative 7.056. And then it's just as simple as 1.5 minus 7.056. So y is negative 5.556 meters, meaning she fell negative 5.556 meters, so her initial height was, well, just 5.556 meters above the water. It's that simple. Can't always do that trick, but on this particular problem, it worked. So with all that said, uh, I hope this was a help to you, and I hope that you learned a lot. If you have any questions or need anything clarified, put a comment down below. I know this was a long video. It might have gone further than what you need to know, but at least now you're going to be an expert. Throw a like down if you actually made it all the way to the end as a source of pride. And uh, I'm going to go take a nap. Mm -hmm.